Hi, everyone. I just want to welcome you to today's session. I am Ashley Mackey. I'm a current board member for OCSS, and I just want to welcome everyone. A little bit about me. I taught social studies courses for the past, um, well, for eight years, I taught social studies, social studies classes. Um, but for, for the past three years, I have been an assistant principal at Deer Creek Middle School in Edmond. Um, throughout the lesson or the session today, I'll be sharing the attendance form. Um, I'll also share the OCSS membership form if you would also like to fill that out. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Andy Meek. Actually, thank you so much for uh, for assisting with the session, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank the Oklahoma Council for the Social Studies for, you know, what is what in some ways is a much simpler conference when you do it in these virtual spaces. And on the other hand, it's much more, much more tricky and complicated. Uh, so I, I do want to acknowledge that. Um, and I want to thank everybody who is attending or perhaps viewing this as a recording after the live session. Um, this is a pretty sideways times and uh, it's not, I don't think any of us take it for granted. Those of us who are not actively in the classroom with young students, uh, we don't take it for granted at all. The, the hard work of not only dealing with a pandemic, not only dealing with what for some of you may be a virtual or blended environment, but also trying to make sense of essentially history that's happening by the minute. You know, your phone rings in your pocket and you realize, oh, I need to, now I need to unpack some other monumental seismic event that's happening in, in the course of human nature. Um, so I do wanna thank you for that. As a past member of the North Carolina Council for the Social Studies Board, as well as the National uh, Council for the Social Studies Board, I also wanna uh, note that uh, NCSS takes the state councils uh, and their relevance and their work at the state level very, very seriously. And I know that the good work being done in Oklahoma by folks like Ashley and her fellow uh, board members is really respected and valued at the, at the national level. So I hope you can continue to support the state council. I hope you find ways to uh, perhaps investigate other um, professional development support organizations like NCHE in Oklahoma. And also take advantage of those national opportunities, including the national conference uh, uh, that's being offered uh, this past year. Of course, it was virtual. Next year, hopefully, we'll be face to face. Um, a couple of things uh, as we get started. Um, take a moment, if you would, to change your, your Zoom name to reflect your first and last name and maybe the school or the school di district you're from. It just makes it easier for me to glance out over this virtual space and get a sense of who's with us or perhaps uh, identify you uh, directly if you've got a question or a comment. Um, you are welcome to use your video cameras at your discretion. Uh, I feel like I'm going through the same kinds of recitations that, uh, that everybody does and they teach virtually. Um, certainly you are welcome to keep that off if you feel like you need to have some privacy or you need to do something in, uh, in concert with listening and participating in the session. But it's always nice to see people's faces and smiles, so feel free to keep that on as well. If you have a question, it will not bother me in the least if you interrupt me. Uh, you can unmute yourself, you can raise your big yellow emoji hand, uh, or you can type a question into the chat box. I have to admit, though, I may not see your question if it's in the chat box because of the sort of the clutter of the Zoom screen on the presenter side. So, uh, Ashley, I'm going to ask that if you see a question I'm missing that you, again, just interrupt me. Consider this more of a conversation than, than any kind of uh, um, uh, linear uh, lecture. And then finally, we are recording today's session. We'll make this available as well as the PowerPoint uh, that I will be sharing with you. So you'll have a chance to review all this uh, after we're completed. My agenda for the next hour is, uh, is pretty ambitious. I'm gonna be moving at a relatively quick pace, um, but I do wanna spend some time not only sharing with you as an introduction, the National Humanities Center and the work that we do on a national level to support humanities and social studies education, I want to give you some really clear and specific examples of the ways in which you can talk about um, issues like protest and the ways that language is being used in protest, both historically and perhaps in a contemporary way. I plan to do that in a very interdisciplinary way. Uh, this is the, the Social Studies Council Conference. On the other hand, you know, we always can find ways to weave in other kinds of disciplines and perhaps uh, work with your colleagues and your teammates and the folks in your department to, to do the same. And then I also want to introduce you to, or perhaps uh, emphasize the value of open education resources in the work you're doing. Again, while we're gonna be doing this virtually and digitally, uh, everything that I'm sharing is also applicable in the classroom in a face-to-face -face model. So don't feel like this is an either or for 
uh, teaching um, in a, in a tr more traditional setting or in a virtual setting. And in terms of the materials that I share with you, I'm gonna be referencing uh, two websites. You are welcome to keep these open, uh, to put these on a separate tab or a separate browser, separate monitor. It will not disrupt me at all if you spend some time investigating as I move through this. I've also put the links in the chat box. Uh, the first is a link to the National Humanities Center primary site. This is where you can find more background information about the center. Uh, you can uh, learn more about the fellowship program that we run for university professors. You can learn more about the advocacy we do for the humanities and social studies more broadly. Uh, one of the things, one of the primary things I want you to pull out of that website, if you were to go there, is that we are a nonprofit, independent nonprofit. So we're not attached to a state or a federal budget. Um, we don't sway with the political winds necessarily. Uh, the center is really dedicated to the creation of humanity scholarship and the advancement of that in education and outreach uh, missions. So when you go there and when we sort of talk through the things that I'm sharing today, please do know that these are free and open resources. Uh, you can use them in any fashion that you see fit. And while I'm gonna give you some, some guidance maybe or talk to you a little bit about the ways that we encourage you to use it, uh, you can do this in, in any form that you want. The second site, the one on the right is the Humanities in Class Digital Library. Uh, this too is a free site, but it does require a registration, what we're calling a library card. So if you go to that URL now and you uh, have not previously been there, you'll come to this page and be prompted for a very quick registration. I can assure you that we are not uh, selling your data. We won't in any way monitor your activity, but it does give us a, um, a sense of community to have people visit and work with us in a digital format, but not in an anonymous format. So uh, having that library card gives you access to everything that I'm sharing, as well as many opportunities that we'll be, uh, we'll be offering in the future. Um, as you move through that uh, site and as you do your registration, you'll then find yourself in this, the home site. Uh, the registration, by the way, does require an email address that you can verify uh, you as being a person, as a human. Um, so you might choose a, an email that you'll, will follow you if you leave your current institution or your current employment. Um, and you might want to check your spam box if you sign up and register and you don't see that email almost immediately. Uh, check your spam box and you'll be able to verify uh, your library card. And so again, I'll be sharing resources today and approaches that specifically are found in the digital library. So I'm joining you tonight from my home in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, the center is located in Durham, North Carolina, and we have for the last 43 years been the world's only independent research center in the humanities. Sometimes I like to describe uh, this building and the setting and what we do here as a laboratory. If you were to hover above the, the glass building, the, the ceilings and the walls that are made of glass, you would look down on an annual fellowship class of university professors. Uh, they're chosen from an application pool. Usually we get about 700 applicants. We take about 35 finalists uh, who become fellows. Uh, these fellows do represent all humanities disciplines, although I would say that history is probably the highest percentage of both past and current fellows. And in some ways, as a laboratory, what they do is create the humanities. What you'll see, though, aren't white lab coats and Bunsen burners and calipers, but what you will see are all those tools of the humanist, things like primary sources and material culture and verse and uh, words and text and film canisters and all the things, you know, all that evidence, all that detritus of the past that can be reassembled and made sense of to better understand who we are today. Uh, the education department that I run is then designed to create uh, bridges between that world, that laboratory, and the world of the classroom. And we do so in a very collegial way. This is not a place where, where you know, kind of smarty cat professors uh, talk at you and tell you what, what the new emerging understandings are. But we do believe that if we ask scholars who are experts and teachers who are experts to work together, they can create very innovative ways to approach humanities education more broadly. So many of our programs involve this kind of conversational, collaborative, uh, co-creative environment and spirit in which scholars and educators can work together. By the way, I do use educators in a little bit of an agnostic way. Um, certainly our highest population and audience are K-12 level educators probably about 60 to 75% of those who work with our digital materials or our, uh, our programs. But we also do quite a bit of work with community college educators and university faculty and grad students. So we're really seeing this as a, as a broader um, uh, approach to humanities and social studies education. 
Every time we do this work though, we create content and it's that content that is free and open and we can make available to the, uh, to the, uh, to the global population. Um, again, you'll find uh, this content on either and both of our websites, but I do wanna re-emphasize that this is, this is free material that we encourage you to use in your instructional design. You know what we're really trying to do? We're trying to build advocates for the humanities. We're trying to build a, an educated citizenry that can uh, understand themselves better, can understand their relationship in a community better, and can understand their role in that, that, uh, that community. So um, really at the, at the end of this, I think what we're trying to emphasize is that humanities are not something you do extra when all the other important things are completed, uh, but these are clear and critical and essential skills and worldviews for all of us to have as we try to untangle what is every single day, a very complicated world uh, that we live in. So there are a couple of specific activities we do I'd like to mention to you before I move on with the uh, presentation. One of them is our annual uh, webinar series. I host about 40 webinars a year, uh, weekly, sometimes biweekly, and they feature lead scholars who discuss compelling topics across the humanities disciplines. I selected just a couple of our upcoming sessions that you might be interested in as social studies educators. That includes uh, starting one with Ari Kelman in about 45 minutes. And if you would like to join us, if you haven't heard me speak enough, you're welcome to sign up for that. It is a free, all of our webinars are free and uh, you, you're welcome to join. Each scholar provides pre-readings and materials that they've curated for the participants. Uh, we have a 90 minute live session and then we have a recording that's available in the digital library. Um, we average about 450 registrants per session, uh, but it doesn't, I think, change the intimacy of the conversation and your ability to interact. So uh, I would highly encourage you to take a look at our spring calendar. And if you'd like to, uh, uh, to sign in, uh, to sign up and to join us, I'll be, be sure to recognize you and send you a shout out. Uh, so take a look at those, please. I'd also like to mention our online course slate. Uh, we have about 10 to 12 courses right now that are offered on a pretty rotating and regular basis. These courses are five week courses that are designed to give you a more immersive experience on a particular topic. Uh, something like becoming visually literate in the humanities classroom. I have a wonderful lead scholar who helped us develop that, uh, provided lots of clear guidance from a scholarly perspective and primary sources. But this is uh, meant to give you a chance to explore this notion that students can be not just uh, text literate, not just audio literate, not just video literate, but visually literate as they approach their curriculum and content. And these courses earn 35 professional development credits. Our webinars, by the way, earn five. So what I'd like to share with you tonight is um, several examples of materials that you can find in the Humanities of Class Digital Library as OER or Open Education Resources. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the distinction between OER as a noun and OER as a verb, and then offer some really clear examples that I hope you can find useful and compelling to use in your classroom. And I will encourage you to modify them, which is a big part of OER. I always uh, like to reference this, uh, this clipping, this newspaper clipping as I start this conversation about OER, uh, partly because it's just a delightful and very nostalgic uh, image from the past published in 1959 in the Chicago Tri Tribune. And who would have thunk, you know, six decades ago that this imagination, this kind of science fiction theory that you would have all of man's documents, if not all of man's knowledge available to you in your home, through a box or through a even smaller box in your pocket. It's just crazy to think how far we've come in terms of access to material. But you know, that comes with, um, with a double-edged sword. It's, it's fantastic to have access to all these materials, but in some ways it creates your job, uh, creates extra responsibility in your job. Now you have to curate and you have to figure out what's vetted. You have to figure out what's free and open. You have to figure out how to assemble that in a way that makes sense for your younger students. I think that the OER platform I'm about to share and the examples might address all of those questions and those issues, things that you probably do naturally now you probably take for granted that this is a part of the way that you consume information as an educator. Uh, but it wasn't that long ago. In fact, when I began my teaching career, there was no internet. There was the World Book Encyclopedia and that made it really easy to find the right material, but it wasn't the good material. Now you can have that, but how do you find material that is, um, that is most helpful for the, for the conversations you're attempting to have? Uh, open education resources is, is actually nothing new. OER has, as a policy and as a methodology, 
been around for maybe 15 years, maybe a little bit longer in some corners. Um, I think this quote in some ways summarizes for me the ways that OER has really shifted uh, our educational landscape. This is from Eric Westendorf and he says, he writes, curriculum is in the midst of a sea change. The days of expensive closed curriculum are numbered. What is emerging will not only save districts and universities money, it will tap into the collective expertise of teachers across the country. In five years, we'll say, hey, remember when we used to buy expensive textbooks that didn't let you adjust to, the, to your students' needs? And it'll be a little bit like saying, hey, remember when you had to put film in your camera? I'm gonna tell you, my, my kids are a little bit older. My son's a senior in high school. My daughter's a junior in college. And if I had, if I just happened to have some of these items and I were to hand them to them, they would have no idea what these things are. But I vividly remember as a kid having these flash bulbs. You get the, you know, the 110 Instamatic camera, the box camera, you put this uh, bulb at the top and every time you took a picture, you had to rotate it with a, a thumb dial and the bulb would rotate as well. And so of course you can count that you had four flashes per bulb and then you had to get rid of it. Who knows where these are sitting by the way and what landfill they're in. But the, the, the manual process of taking an image, and by the way, then you had to mail that off somewhere and they would send it back to you or take it to the CVS. The manual um, technicality of taking an image is my kids would never think that that's what it meant to document their world visually. And in some ways, I think OER uh, may be in a very corollary uh, relationship with textbooks. Uh, again, I can remember when I started my teaching career, um, having you know a solid 45 minutes set aside on the first day to hand out textbooks and have kids put those, those grocery bag covers on them so they could write their names. Uh, textbooks are, are old. They're static, they can't change. Uh, they're very, very expensive. I would say really the, uh, the cusp of OER uh, started at the university level and the, uh, the community college level when professors realized how, uh, how many of their students couldn't afford to buy their textbooks, therefore couldn't afford to do their work. Um, I think many districts around the country now are realizing that teachers are already uh, working in digital assets versus textbooks. And so you save a lot of money by not having them. But it also, again, brings up this question of where do you get the resources and how do you know that they're trusted and how do you know that they're free and open? And that's where I think tools like the digital library come into play. And again, if you've got a library card now, you can walk through this front door and you can see on your own some of the functions that I'm going to describe briefly before sharing specific examples. Uh, to begin with, you'll find all of the materials from the National Humanities Center in the digital library. Uh, this does include both primary sources, scholar essays, video recordings, as well as instructional materials, as well as more recent and more common multimedia resources like podcasts and uh, virtual recordings. Um, you'll also find, though, uh, content from over 80 other humanities organizations. If you go through the partners page, you'll recognize many of them in the social studies world as, as trusted, vetted organizations that you can go and get to materials. Um, in this case, it's a really nice place to find them all in the same place. Now, repositories aren't new. You can probably go to a lot of clearing houses and find a lot of these places listed uh, at the, in the same page. I think what I'm gonna to describe tonight though is your ability to work in a lab fashion with the materials that have been, uh, that have been shared. All these materials do have a Creative Commons non-commercial license. That means that they're free, they're open, you can use them, you can copyright them. I'm, I'm sorry, you can uh, distribute them to your kids. You can use them in your Google Classroom. You just can't sell them because what we don't want are any users to come take our resources and sell them on Teacher Pay Teacher or some other site. Uh, what you'll find when you go to the main page and you treat that like a card catalog is that you'll then be able to find these cross discoverable materials. Uh, things like this recording with Ellen McLarney, past fellow at the center and current professor of history at Duke University on the role of art and graffiti in revolts in Egypt and Syria. You'll find uh, materials like this from the Rock and Roll Forever Foundation on the ways that music has been used to lead protest. You'll even find teacher created materials that have been contributed and published. Uh, materials like this developed by a graduate student from University of North Carolina on uh, student protests in the 2018 National School Walkout. So just by searching a simple key term like protests or language of protest, you'll pull up uh, 
all these resources from uh, the different organizations that have contributed. Again, you'll recognize many of them, uh, big national organizations like the American Historical Society or the National Constitution uh, Center, but you'll also recognize quite a few smaller organizations you may have never heard of, university centers or local museums or regional kinds of organizations. I would encourage you at the conclusion of today's session to also check out the collections. If you go to the Discover tab and collect, select collections, you'll find one titled Language of Protest. Currently, there are 133 resources that have been curated there, and you'll be able to find what I'm sharing as well as other resources that have been made available. So with your library card, uh, and as you explore the site and the platform, you'll be able to create uh, folders that you can select and save materials based on your profile. That profile is in the upper right-hand corner. You can see my little icon image. Uh, if you click that at any point, you'll find materials that you can save and you can bring forward to your own instructional planning. This site is primarily teacher facing, but we certainly have and work with teachers in schools that issue students library cards, particularly high school level students. And by doing so, they can then view uh, different primary sources, recordings, et cetera, as a part of assignments they might make. Uh, again, explore the curated collections. Um, and I also wanna emphasize that this is a platform that is fully integrated into Google Classrooms as well as most, if not all, learning management systems. So uh, again, if you're teaching blended or in a virtual format, uh, you can find ways to use uh, the digital library in that context. Hey, here's another, uh, what I think is just a, a delightful uh, cartoon published in 1960. Again, who would have imagined uh, way back then, uh, 60 years ago, that a student would be at home with their electronic notebook, looking at a screen while the hovercraft is out in the uh, driveway and, and mom is making uh, dinner of some kind. Uh, it's so present, it's so, so much of a foreshadowing for where we are now that uh, to me it's, it's uh, very exciting actually to see that they were able to, uh, to have that imagination. So that's the digital library as a platform, but I'm going to give you some specific examples. And these, are, these will come in two forms. One will be in the form of what I'll call scholarly materials. So again, these are scholar created materials for the classroom, for the public consumption, essays, articles, video recordings, primary source collections, training materials, et cetera. I like to show uh, a couple or at least one that really reflects specifically on what I think is a language of protest and identity. So some of you may recognize the picture. Some of you may recognize the title. You might know who this is. You can use the chat box if you like. Who is this person? joining us um, 150 some years later. Anybody recognize this person? You got it, Christy, thank you. This is Walt Whitman. This is Leaves of Grass. Uh, I very much uh, remember as a young person reading parts of and uh, eventually all of Leaves of Grass and Song of Myself. Walt Whitman, as many of you know, um, is really considered the, the great American poet. Um, mid 19th century uh, wrote uh, extensively and was able to articulate the value of the American identity, particularly after the Civil War and after the, uh, the, the deconstruction and then hopefully reconstruction of the American culture. There's a copy of the book that fo has followed me in every move I've had since high school. Uh, margins, Notes in the Margins, you know, a book that is always on my shelf, even as I try my best to purge myself of having books on shelves. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that, that speaks to you, the verse. Uh, it's one of those things to me that provides a very clear pathway to the past and guidance perhaps for the present. And there are certain lines that stood out to me even when I was young, not lines that really seem to linger with me, seem to reach in and make sense to me in a way that almost didn't make sense because it was written a century beforehand. And here's one of those uh, lines. Do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And as a young person, as a high school student, I very specifically remember having this sensation of growing up in a very small town, and I guarantee you smaller than any of the communities you live in in Oklahoma, knowing that there was something else, there, there was something over the horizon line, something that I could use beyond uh, just this immediate context of my high school or my sports team or my parents and what my family was providing. And I remember uh, specifically Song of Myself, and perhaps this is why it has uh, remained in our 
sort of American canon for so long, I specifically remember also being struck by this notion that as captured by this line, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, this notion that I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people that probably feel something similar, that there's something I have in common with other people. In fact, I have it in common with this person who lived many, many, many decades before me. So, you know, Song of Myself to me is, is captured in a, it, it has captured a place and it allows us, I think, to talk about things like culture and identity and community and country and nation in really specific and literary and interdisciplinary terms. One of the scholars that we've worked with, I've worked with at the center is a scholar named Jennifer Crandall. Uh, actually, a scholar doesn't do her justice, I think. She's uh, a writer, she's a journalist, she's, um, uh, she's California born, but has lived all over the world. And in my conversations with her has also uh, articulated the same kinds of, of sort of uh, growth pains where you, you are searching for who you are and how you can relate to people around you. Um, Jennifer was, uh, was able both uh, through her independent work as well as some, uh, some funded work to create what I think is one of the most beautiful, elegant digital projects I have ever seen. And it's one that I encourage you to think about uh, exploring with your own students, regardless of what you teach. I'm going to share with you just one of the, the resources here um, as a way that you can start to think about teaching protest and identity in your classroom. So here's what Jennifer did. She um, decided to take Song of Myself. Uh, Song of Myself has 52 verses. Uh, I think right now she's through verse, she hasn't done them in order, but she's accomplished, I think, 27 verses total. Uh, she is continuing to work on completing the set. And she traveled with a film crew around the state of Alabama. Um, I, I grew up in the mid-Atlantic. Mid I grew up in Virginia. Uh, I have grown up in the South. I've lived in the South my whole life. Alabama, frankly, to me, has always connotated a very specific culture and personality type. You know, I think of Joe Namath, I think of Bear Bryant, I think of uh, Roy Moore, I think of uh, violent demonstrations uh, in the civil rights movement. I think of, um, you know, I, I, there, there's a very specific kind of view I have of Alabamians. And I can't say that Jennifer approached the state of Alabama in the, in the ways that she did because of what I think but I think she did see it as a quintessential American state. And she traveled the state and she found people, regular everyday people from a wide variety of ages and backgrounds of skin colors and demographics to recite verses of Song of Myself into a camera and create a digital project around that. And the result again, in my view is absolutely beautiful because it shows a contemporary face and context but you can hear the historical words of identity and collaboration and bringing together around this common American spirit. I've chosen several that I thought that I might share with you tonight as an example. Um, if you go to this site, WhitmanAlabama.org, you can find all of these. Again, this is free and open. Uh, I will sit there and watch every single one of them and literally cry. Uh, the one with Virginia Mae Schmidt, verse one, is absolutely beautiful. Uh, Virginia May is unfortunately not with us anymore. She's passed, which gives it a little extra context. Each clip, by the way, also has a biograph biography of the speaker as well as some context of the process. I don't think I want to share her tonight. There's also really a wonderful one, verse 37, featuring John Graham and Chris Freeman and sort of a, 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 a almost a, a recited kind of story around the verse. Uh, as you can see, uh, Chris is a judge. And it's uh, recorded in a courthouse in an actual trial setting. Um, and again, that to me is it's just really remarkable the way it gets the words get to the heart of what's important to us as Americans in terms of our democratic process of rehabilitation, of, um, of community, of empathy. I don't think I want to share that either. What I'd like to share is this one. Uh, verse 39, Jason Tapper. Um, all these, by the way, are no more than three, four, five minutes long, so they're easy to share and consume in your class. But I'm going to take a moment to share this and uh, view it. And I, what I'd like you to think about is how you might use either these, this resource or this approach in your own curriculum and teaching. Um, I can see Kimberly, I think, when I start this, you should hear something. Just give me a thumbs up that you can hear it, please.
violent, dark, um, violent, dark, manipulative, very manipulative. Um, lens for me? Well, I used to be embarrassed about what I've done and how I was and all the people I've hurt. That's part of who I am today, so, you know, I might, ain't nothing to hide. My shirt's soaking wet, all sweaty for the camera. <laughs> the friendly and flowing savage, who is he? Is he waiting for civilization or past it and mastering it? Is he some Southwesterner raised outdoors? Is he Canadian? Is he from the Mississippi country? Iowa, Oregon, California, the mountains, prairie life, bush life, or sailor from the sea? Wherever he goes, men and women accept and desire him. They desire he should like them, touch them, speak to them stay with them. I love the way things are going right now. It's where I've come from. Is he from the Mississippi country? Iowa, Oregon, California, the mountains. Behavior lawless as snowflakes. Words simple as grass. Uncombed head, laughter and naivety. Slow stepping feet, common features, common modes and emanations. They descend in new forms from the tips of his fingers. They are wafted with the odor of his body or breath. They fly out of the glance of his eyes. It's all right. Who wrote that? Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman? Seems like you can be a wild man or a, or, or gentle, you know? I kind of think about myself when I read that thing, really. Savage man, you know? Is that true? Yes, ma'am. I think one of the reasons I like that clip a lot is that I can tell you I taught 150 of Jason Tappers. I know that kid and I know, uh, you know, the, the, the ways in which, um, you know, li life has, uh, has given him some questions and you know, I think it's it's just beautiful at the end where he says, you know, wow, I can sort of see myself in that. And again, of course, what he's what he's really what the entire poem, what all the verses really speak to is the connections and the things we have in common more than the differences we have. Pardon me while my cat gets booted. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, these are just lovely uh, things that you can use in your teaching. Uh, I have worked with many teachers who have uh, just simply played them and sort of reflected on them, uh, perhaps using them in the Civil War or Walt Whitman unit, uh, but also a lot of teachers who have explored having students uh, create these kinds of vignettes. So whether it's a historical document, whether it's the Constitution, whether it's, um, you know, something, uh, some kind of memoir or diary that you might pull out, or maybe it's something from uh, the literary canon that you actually have students read different passages into a camera. Kids are so good at documenting themselves and kind of giving voice to that. But being able to, to not role play, they're not simulating, they're just trying to channel. They're trying to put, put those words into their own mouths and chew them up and see how they feel. Um, and I would encourage you to consider uh, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of connections. You can find uh, resources around Whitman, Alabama in the digital library, including uh, the clips and the site itself as well as material that Jennifer has uh, curated for us, uh, particularly a recording that I did a webinar with her this past, um, uh, this past fall. So the other kinds of resources I like to feature as examples uh, are more instructional in nature. And again, if you go into the digital library and you treat it like a card catalog, you'll find activities and lessons and PowerPoints and syllabi and bibliographies, all the, the sort of puzzle pieces you need to put together your curriculum uh, here are a couple of examples that specifically deal with uh, with revolt, I'm sorry, with protest and social movements. So the first is an activity I'm going to ask you to engage with me on. Um, this is an activity that uh, I have found to be very, very popular regardless of age, regardless uh, of context, really even regardless of discipline. It's great as a do now or a sort of a class starter. It's great as a prompt. It's great as a formative assessment. 
it's called the playlist activity. And what I'm gonna do is uh, select, I have selected an historical figure. And that historical figure as grayed out is what you're trying to figure out. So this is, I'm gonna provide you some clues and your job is to guess who that historical figure is. These clues will be um, pretty explicit in my two examples, but if, you've got, if you teach older kids, uh, high school kids, AP level kids, you can make this as granular and nuanced as fits the, uh, fits the student and you can differentiate by both class and by topic. What I'm gonna do is take this historical figure, uh, could also be a time period, it could be a literary character, it could be anything else that's creative, anything that you can, you can provide clues to figure uh, the final answer out. What I'm gonna do is give you oral clues, audio clues. I'm gonna play three songs. And each of those songs has a clue in it of who this person is. I'm also gonna have a text clue, uh, but again, if you wanted to differentiate to make it either harder or easier, you could remove that or you could make the text clues uh, even trickier. So I'm gonna play these uh, one at a time. I won't play the song long, maybe 10 seconds each. And then I'm gonna invite you to put in the chat box who you think this person is. First person who guesses it gets a discount code to have one of our online courses for free. Okay, here we go. right the mystery person in this case is Winston Churchill you can see that uh, each of the songs had a reference to him again it would be you know you could differentiate by making the songs more uh, uh, a little trickier you could remove the text clues you can make uh, the clues to be more of illusions or more of kind of three-step clues I find that people of all ages, they love to figure things out. They love puzzles. They love to guess things. And they also like to make puzzles. So I've also worked with a lot of teachers who have had students create these kinds of playlist activities to either test each other or, again, to have as a formative assessment or even a prompt on a more summative uh, assessment. I'm going to do one more for you real quickly. Try this one. You guys think any guesses? Wah, wah, wah. RBG. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, of course, all those songs referenced her age, her, uh, her, her at the time at least cancer, um, cancer struggle, and uh, her fighting spirit. So I, I would encourage you to figure out ways that music can unlock these more complicated topics. We do have an online course, by the way. You're welcome, Kimberly, to join this for free. From the 60s to now, this explores ways that we can use music, uh, contemporary music, to explore uh, issues of the late 20th century. And again, this says starting November 9th, I apologize. The next course will be uh, March the 8th. We'd, we'd love to have you join. So then the last example I'm gonna share with you, again, these are resources you can find in the digital library, is this one. Uh, it's probably very familiar and very common for each of you to do uh, primary source analysis in your classroom. You probably have a variety of, uh, of graphic organizers or ways to approach this, things that you ask your students to linger with and understand. To me, this is an extremely compelling and provocative image. Um, it brings up all sorts of things that you might see, questions you might have, or things you might like to know. A pretty traditional and straightforward, pretty classic uh, way to unpack these, these images. But I'm going to ask you just to take a minute to look at it and Maybe even 
maybe even ask those questions uh, yourself uh, in the chat box or perhaps unmute yourself. You know, what do you, what do you see here? What 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 parts of this uh, draws the most questions from you? What are you most interested in learning more about? I'll give you a moment to look at the entirety of that image. For some of you, it may be the uh, the, the military force, if that's what it is. Um, you know, certainly the the actions, the uh, the helmets, uh, the batons seem to be military issue. They seem to be dressed similarly. They seem to have the same, you know, purpose if not mission. On the other hand, there's one of those images: the person on the right side of the screen who's got uh, their left foot sort of sort of raised and ready to 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 go down. It looks like uh, doesn't seem to be in the same military kind of garb. Um, some of the batons don't seem to be issued at all, but rather just metal pipes or things that they may have found in the street. Um, not all of the, the, the troops here, if that's what they are, seem to be fully engaged in what's happening in the center of the screen. Uh, one of the guys, in fact, in the upper right-hand corner is kind of staring off in the, the distance. Maybe he's, maybe he's worried about something, somebody who's advancing, or maybe he's watching somebody retreat. But really what your eye is likely drawn to most explicitly is the image in the middle of the screen, uh, the female form on the ground, perhaps unconscious, being pulled, um, pulled so violently and, and hard that her shirt has come up, her tunic has come up. You can't see her face, but you could, it's a very intimate image. You see her, her torso, you can see uh, you know, her arms, her bare arms. You can't see her face, but you can see this really stark and jarring blue bra. Um, th this is an image that uh, actually became viral in the uh, early 2010s, uh, decade of 2010s in the Arab Spring, when um, there was a, uh, a huge social uprising around democratic voting. And in fact, in the Women's March in 2011, that blue, blue bra became a symbol, became a very powerful viral icon of this social unrest. And you can find it all around Middle Eastern cities and countries, uh, drawn, hand-drawn as graffiti. Um, all these images, by the way, were taken by the lead scholar, Ellen McLarney, who was doing research on the topic and has added these to the digital library. You can find examples of the blue bra in, in the abstract. You can find them uh, in very specific um, ways used as, as art as activism. You can find them uh, you know, used as a rallying cry, used as a way to bring forward uh, you know, those, those interests and those, uh, that, that uprising around democracy. You can see them in very formal ways, very sort of formal um, uh, remixed and repurposed ways. You can see them in cartoonish ways. You know, suddenly in just a, a year or two, uh, how uh, this, I, this, this image became a, a viral symbol of democratic reform and gender reform in the Middle East. And then the subsequent voting in Syria and Libya and Morocco and other countries where women became extremely active members of the voting population, Yemen as well. So uh, being able to talk about the ways in which uh, art and graffiti was used to inspire and aspire uh, this kind of democratic uh, uprising is also material that you can find in the digital library. And I would encourage you to, to both search for it and spend some time with uh, conversations we've had with Ellen, with work that we've done, as well as an online co course we have on uh, understanding the modern Middle East as ways to bring those materials forward for your students to understand these in much more, um, much more explicit terms. So those are three examples that I thought I'd share with you tonight around the theme of uh, protest language. Um, again, all of these are free and open, but that open gives you more than just license to use it. It also gives you license to remix it. For example, if you search for the playlist activity, you likely will find what other teachers in other parts of the country have done with the playlist activity, but you're always going to ch change it. That's what all teachers do is we modify and we change and we adjust, if not from class to class, sometimes kid to kid. And this is a site where you can then publish those remixed versions so that the first and the 10th and the 50th version are all in one place. You can also, whether you're a department chair or a leader in your curriculum design, perhaps if you're a, uh, an administrator like Ashley or someone in the central office, 
You can also use this as a place to encourage teachers to publish their work under the Humanities in Class Digital Library Citation. Um, this is a way to share your work more broadly. It's also a place for schools and departments and faculty to become involved in curriculum work together. Um, all of this can be student facing. And again, it does offer direct citation to the individual author or the individual school district. Finally, I'd like to mention that there is a conference room or a group function in this platform. I've got a lot of school districts who are creating their own conference rooms where their teachers can be invited to join and curated sets of folders of materials can be available. Those rooms can be closed so that teachers from other places can't join or they can be open if you'd like to encourage that kind of collegial work. So whether it's the Oklahoma Council for Social Studies room or uh, one of your individual school districts or one of your individual grade levels or one of your individual interests, all users can create and moderate uh, groups in the platform. When you join the library, you'll have access to all the documentation you need to share this with your colleagues, your faculty, and your network, and I hope that you do so. And that can become a more formal uh, relationship with the center. Right now, we have 19 schools around the country, uh, including as far west as Bering Strait School District in Alaska, who are early adopters. This is not a, uh, a, a formal agreement. This is not a MOU. This doesn't have any funding whatsoever. This is just our way of saying, if you're creating curriculum using this OER platform, we will help you at no cost. We'll be available to support your teachers, to give online trainings, to make sure that uh, you understand the system. And if there's any gaps that you'd like to address, that we can help you find the resources that address it. So if you go to the, uh, uh, to this, uh, to the library, you can also sign up for that. Again, it's just a simple uh, intake form that then allows us to communicate uh, directly. So I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. I'm a little bit early. Uh, I've got saved just a few minutes at the end before we both, we all have to go to other things. Um, I would encourage you to follow the National Humanities Center on our websites, as well as our social media. And I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you might have at this point. Kimberly, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat box. Uh, email me and I'll give you the code for the free online course. Any questions at all? Anything I can help you with? Well, I want to thank you for joining me for essentially work after work. <laughs> you guys have been teaching all day and you came and joined me this afternoon. I hope I do see you in future Humanities Center uh, activities um, that may come in 40, 25 minutes when I do my next webinar. Um, but hopefully I'll see you again sometime soon. Ashley, thank you for all your help. Yes, Andy, thank you so much. And for everyone that joined us today, please don't forget to fill out the attendance form and also fill out the OCSS membership form so we can get you all of the resources that we have available.